Good day. It's Art Hostage here again, and we're going to do another episode. Now, today's episode is going to be called Sunday Roasty Beef. Now, I've just finished my roast dinner, my Sunday lunch, right? And I had um, rib of beef, hot horseradish sauce, roast potatoes in goose fat, asparagus on the side, right? Cabbage, right? And a few other bits and pieces. Now, I don't have a dinner plate. Right, I've got an Amari charger, right, and because I live on my own, I only cook for four and demolish the whole lot, so I'm feeling a bit bloated. So I just want to get a few things out of the way before we get into the story. Right, oh, another thing, right now, my podcast is going to be called the Art Hostage Fireside Chats Podcast, and those of you who know about history, right, will know that the last time someone called their um, chats, fireside chats, was FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, during the Second World War when he was trying to motivate the uh, and keep up morale with the American people. Now, I don't know whose morale I'm trying to keep up, but I just thought it's nice, fireside chat, art hostage fireside chats, you know, podcast. Anyways, right, so that's that out of the way. And what else have I got to talk about? Oh, right, today, right, today we're going to talk about Mickey Openshaw and Trixie Openshaw. Right, because those of you who have been keeping up the sin that Mickey's put his um, um, his side of the story with the Lowry case, um, actually, and I can confirm, that is 101% true. 100% true. Everything that Mickey Openshaw says is true. Right? Um, and Trixie, I just want to do a bit of background. I first met Trixie Openshaw at the Alexandra Arms Hotel on Lewis Road in the late 70s. I went there with um, Gary Lipscomb and Steve. Ste I can't remember his name. He lived up Newmarket Road. Anyway, Trixie, you know who I mean. Anyway, Gary Lipscomb and Steve and a couple of others. And Trixie was there behind the bar, right? She's very mumsy, like a matriarch and all that, a genuine, gracious host and all that. Anyway, Mickey comes out, right? And he reminded me of um, that Rene, you know, from Hello, Hello. Right, but it weren't bonjour, it was, uh, hello mate, hello mate. Right, and he had the um, apron wrapped over his um, over his arm. Very nice people and all that. So anyway, then in 1982, they had a meeting, right? All the Knocker boys were getting together because they wanted legal representation and they were going to form a fund. But because no one could be trusted with the money, um, it never happened. Right, now, uh, right, now on the Lowry case, right, in 1998 or 97, obviously by that time, um, you know, I was still the star informant, um, but, you know, Terry Boyle was sort of much more low profile, um, or should I call him Terry Biglow? No, te and Terry Boyle, the other star informant, um, was uh, very quiet. Now, I used to talk to um, a woman called Carol, I'm not going to give her last name, but Carol, who was the secretary for the Sussex Police Art and Antique Squad, right? She weren't in the broom cupboard, right? She had her own little office, but she was a secretary and collator. So she knew everything, absolutely everything. She would, right? But I, right, and I formed a wonderful relationship with Carol. I'd call her up and she'd call me up as well every day. And we'd always have a little chat and a debrief and what's going on and all that. And she'd tell me all the scandal. I mean, you know, like Paul Grundy when he was addicted to Valium. Oh, fuck me. She rang me up one day and she said, oh, Paul Grundy's just come in. Yeah, he's high on Valium. I went, oh, don't let him drive. She went, nah, Simon Muggleton's doing the driving. I went, oh, okay. Anyway, that's another story. We can go into that. Well, let's get back, back to the Lowry case, right? Now, the Lowry case, right, um, Nine months, right, they've had the deal and it's all gone down. And then nine months later, the daughter of Dr. Hancock, right, spots the Lowry's in Richard Green's and she goes in and asks how much and he says 200 grand or 215 grand or the assistant did. And because she was so gutted, right, money grabbing, right, um, and pissed off, right, that's when the screen went up. Right, Dr. Hancock, he was at me, you know, didn't, you know, they, he was very good friends with Mickey Openshaw and Bobby Barrett, right? And another thing as well, yes, Bobby, Par Bobby Barrett had loads of form, yes, he was a bad guy and, and it's proven, yes. Mickey Openshaw has never stolen a thing in his whole life, 
right? He is straight as a gun barrel, right? Not least because if he had ever stolen an antique and gone home to Trixie, right, she would have twisted his ear, kicked him up the arse, gone down the police station and said, right, now fucking give it back, right? She would not tolerate it, right? So, so that's just one reason, no, no, you know, and I've got no reason to lie, right? All the other crime stuff and all that, you notice that no one is writing up there, uh, is commenting, oh, he's lying, it's all lies, because it's the truth. So when I tell you the truth that Mickey Openshaw has never stolen one thing in his whole life, that's the truth. I mean, you know, you can't change that fact. Right, so anyway, um, oh, and another thing as well. Yes, Mickey, yeah, yeah, um, you're right. Bobby Barrett had his car stolen, right, and, and he said that the client details book was um, burnt or stolen, right, when that's not really the truth. Now, I don't want to piss on Bobby Barrett's parade, but behind your back, Mickey, because he knew you was too straight, he was giving out target addresses to burglars and they were stealing the stuff and Bobby Barrett was selling it and not telling you, right? It, right, that's the truth of the matter. Right? It's not that you're naive, but he thought you was too straight and you wouldn't want to get involved in anything like that. So that's how the Malvern call was leaked out right, and, and given out and all the other calls that were done and all that, the other target addresses, right? So at the end of the day, it was nothing to do with you, but Bobby Barrett on the side behind your back right, kept the client details and then was given them out as things. So that's that sorted. Now, where are we? Lowry case, right? Now, on the Lowry case, so I'm talking, you know, just as usual, everyday Carol and all that, and then you're coming up for trial. Two days before the verdict's due to come in on the Friday, on the Wednesday, right, Carol calls me. Oh, hello, Ashley. She used to call me Ashley, you know, code name. was that's fucking stupid. But anyway, hello, Ashley, how you doing? I went, yeah, not bad. I said, uh, what's happening then? She said, oh, well, they're all up in London, didn't they, for the, um, for the Barrett and Openshaw trial. I went, yeah. Um, I said, how's it going then, yeah? She went, oh, it's all right, the fix is in. Yeah, they're going to be found guilty on Friday, weighed off straight away, four years each in jail. I went, all oh, right, okay. Um, so then we talked about other things and all that. Boom, put the phone down. And I think to myself, this is a fucking diabolical liberty. You know, Bobby Barrett, okay, I mean, if you can make an argument for fitting people up, Right, which you, I don't think you can, but Bobby Barrett had got rid, um, had got away with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of art thefts, burglaries, and all kinds of other stuff. So if he gets convicted of something he didn't do, some people can say that that's poetic justice or karma or whatever. But little old Mickey Oakman, sure, right? He's never stole fuck all in his life, right? And I thought to myself, that's a fucking diabolical liberty, right? And so what I did is I phoned up Bubbles and I went, Bubbles, um, the fix is in. I said, um, you know, Mickey and Bobby, they better fucking throw a seven in the dock, right? Otherwise, they're going to they're be found guilty and, and, and um, they're going to get four years each. And then, and then Bubble, well, Bubbles, anyone who knew Bubbles, whenever you said hello to him, it was like, hello, Bubbles. It'd be, how are you, cock? <laughs> in a really deep voice. Right, anyway, so he's like, how are you, cop? Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Boom, I told that he went, all right, I'll pass it on. Boom, phone goes down. Now, to make sure, right, that it was going to get back to Mickey, I know Bubbles was going to tell him, but I phoned Derek Hunt. Because if ever you wanted anything to go round Brighton, it'll be Derek Hunt, right? So all he's like the oracle. Anyway, so boom, hello, Derek. Hello, hello. Yeah, basically, well, uh, anyway, boom. And took, tell Derek Hunt the same thing. Friday comes, bang, Mickey Openshaw, Bobby Barrett, found guilty, right? Now, normally you get two weeks, right? Standard practice when you're found guilty of this kind of crime, right? Or most kinds of crime, obviously not murder, right? But you, you get two weeks to get your affairs in order and you come back for sentencing. Ah, okay, now, no, because this was such a corrupt trial and it was, it was corrupt from the beginning, right? The judge... Went, yeah, none of that two weeks um, um, to get your affairs in order or probation reports. I'm ready to sentence now. Bang. Bobby Barrett, right, take him down four years. Mickey Openshaw, boom, take him down four years. Done. Right, that's it. So all of a sudden, I get a phone call early evening Friday from Carol. Hello, Ashley. She said, did you hear what happened? I went, well, now tell me. So she said, yeah, they got found guilty and got four years. Right. 
I said, fuck me. I said, you're unreal. I said, can you do me a favour? She said, what's that? I said, can you give me next week's lottery numbers? And she laughed. Right, now I know it's not funny, right? But you can imagine, you know what I mean? I mean, this is like they're meant to be the, you know, the wheels of justice and all that. And it's all come undone. So anyway, during the time leading up to this, right, there's the talk about Tony Block, the solicitor, has charged Mickey Openshaw and Bobby Barrett £30,000. £30,000, but up front. Right? None of that afterwards, right? Now, when you pay for a barrister, you have to pay up front to the solicitor because the barrister wants to guarantee their money, right? But the actual solicitor's fees, right, you don't have to settle until after the case. But in this instance, Tony Block wanted it all up front because he was part of the conspiracy against his own clients, Mickey Openshaw and Bobby Barrett, right? Now, later transpires, okay, that Tony Block was working with Mickey Underwood over the William Orpin painting. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to get Mickey uh, Underwood, right, f um, to show it, and then he, and then the police were going to seize it, and then Tony Bl Block would try and, like, um, grab himself a share of it. Well, Mickey Underwood was so cute. I mean, there's no way it got, ever got produced, you know what I mean? And then Mickey, Mickey Underwood died, right? Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to... Um, sort out an arrangement where the estate of the lady in the Isle of Man and Rachel Underwood, right, are given 50% interest each in the William Orpin Girls on the Beach painting, and then it can be sold for up to a million pound, and the money given 50% to the Isle of Man lady's estate and 50% to Rachel Underwood. And me, Art Hostage, well, I want the same as I always get. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Okay, and that means the William Orpin, Orpin then comes out of hiding and the world can see it again. But I warn you now, unless the agreement is legally binding, it will be a set up and a sting. Okay, right. And so at the end of the day, I want to be able to sign off on this and say, hang on a minute, this is definitely right. Because otherwise, if you're not careful what they'll do, the minute it gets produced, then they'll go back on it and say, no, 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 no. Now the woman in the Isle of Man's estate gets everything and Rachel Underwood gets fuck all, right? So anyway, but that's something else that we can talk about at another time, you know what I mean? Right, so now back to Mickey Openshaw, yeah. So Mickey Openshaw gets four years in jail and Bobby Barrett, right? They come out, you know, they come out two years later or whatever or they got to say for it. And to be honest with you, it left a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, to be honest, most of the art and antique trade, it's dog eat dog. Kill or be killed, do you know what I mean? If, if they're going to give out two years jail sentence, I'd rather someone else serve it than I've got to serve it, right? And that's why that what you will learn is Brighton has been synonymous with informants and grasses for hundreds of years, decades. Now, if you speak to any old school or any, any London criminals, even to this day, right, about Brighton criminals or Brighton antique people, they say that, right, they say that one of three things happen to you. You either get fucked, nicked, or both. Brighton boys are so slippery, they cannot even be trusted with people in the in the criminal world, right? At the end of the day. Oh, and right, and they're going back to Tony Block. Oh yeah. And then later on, I find out, and I've only fucking seen the documents, Tony Block was a registered police informant for decades for the flying squad, the Sweeney Todd, you know, them like, you know, um, we're the Sweeney darling and we ain't had their dinner. Yeah, the flying squad, Scotland Yard's flying squad. Tony Block was a registered informant with them for decades. And he was giving up armed robbers here and drug dealers there and all kinds of other people. And they were giving him tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds for the intelligence he was giving. Now, do you remember the other episode on Tony Marjotta? Now, I'm going to do another one on Tony because I've got so many good stories. Well, do you remember when Tony Marjotta got robbed by this armed robber called Gypsy Charlie Lee? Right, yeah, I'm, yeah, you do remember. Yeah, that's right, Brian Groves and all that 10 grand stand. Well, and you remember when Gypsy Charlie Lee was already under surveillance by the flying squad? Yeah, you remember that, didn't you? And then they lost him. He robbed Marjotta, took the antiques over to Teresa Boyle, and then he's back round the gyrate tree, and then all of a sudden the Sweeney flying squad swoop on him. Right. 
Tony Block was the original informant to the Flying Squad about Charlie, a uh, Gypsy Charlie Lee, and that's why they had had him under surveillance for the period of time leading up to the Marjotta theft. So Tony Block was the police informant who told the Flying Squad right about Gypsy Charlie Lee, and then they launched the inquiry into Charlie Lee. A period of time went, and they were building up a case, and then he went down to Brighton to rob Marjotta, and the rest we know is history, or you can go back uh, to the other one um, to do that, uh, to, uh, to like cross-reference what I've just said now, right? So you can see that this is a hornet's nest, isn't it, eh? It is, isn't it? And at the end of the day, we go right to the bottom to, say, like the thief, the knocker boy, the dealer, the handler, the dealer in London, the solicitors, right, the prosecutors, then the art police, then you go to um, the CPS, then you go to the judges, Right, and the common denominator between all of them is they're all fucking corrupt and crooked and dirty, right? But as you go up the food chain, they then get firewalls between them, right? And I think it's hypocritical that they hide behind this cloak of respectability when they're just as crooked as everyone else, right up to judges. Of course it is, right? But no one seems to think of that. You know, they think the burglar, scummy, drug dealer, yeah, which is right. But then as it goes down the f up the food chain, all the people involved have got an interest in it. And make no mistake, they're just as crooked, right, as the burglar who's stolen the things in the first place or the knocker boy. Right, and I hope that people understand that. But I just want to set the record straight. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, all I recall is my memories. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to tell you, right, when I do these things, I don't get all my notes out and write it all down professionally like most people do. I could, but what I just do is I sit here, I go, boom, I click record and then just talk to you like I am now. So it's all from memory. And I'm not being flat. I just want you to know that it's like a fireside chat. You know, like talking in the pub or, or having a bit of dinner down the China Garden or something like that or at Gabby's. Remember Gabby's? Oh, I've got another story about him. Gabby, remember Gabby, the painting buyer? What was he, La Dolce Vita, yeah, down down the street out, um, out of, yeah, he was a police informant as well, because people were saying, because he used to cover the restaurant in all the paintings, and you could go in there and go, boom, you know, I, I, one day I went in there and I counted 11 paintings, right, in the restaurant on the wall that were stolen, not only stolen, they were on the stolen list, and the antique squad used to go in there for lunch as well, and lunch and dinner. Right, anyway, but that's another but that's another story as well. Gabby. Wonder what ever happened to him. Right, I, yeah, never knew what, what happened to him. Um, anyway, right, so so when I do these things, right, I'm you know, I jump around all over the place because I'm just like talking to you. There's no script. Um and so if I get a name wrong, um um well, not so much the name, but a date wrong, um like what was the other one? Oh, Adrian Marjotter, I said he was born in seventy four, he was born in seventy three. Right now, I've got all the information anywhere there, but um, everywhere about uh, yeah, here in my archives, and I could get it out, and maybe I'll start doing it so it's all scripted and all that. But what you're seeing is what you're getting, you know. What I mean, it's raw, you know, there's no professional stuff, do you know. What I mean, you know, I'm not Joe Rogan, right? Not by any stretch of the imagination, right? So you ain't got to worry, you, you know, um, but that's the way I just thought I would do it because it's authentic. You know, I mean, I think I'd be an editor's dream. For every half an hour, I think you'd probably find two minutes usable. Um, but, yeah, so that's so that's the way it does. Right, so now, yeah, Mickey Openshaw and Trixie. Right, um, I don't know if I should tell this story about Trixie, should I? Yeah, I will. Now, Trixie, Trixie Openshaw, right, she was always very mumsy, right, caring and that, right? Now, some of the clients, or sorry, customers would come in and they would drink and all this carry on. And she knew that, that they were spending the housekeeping money and that the kids wouldn't get any food. But what, and you know what she used to do? Quietly, secretly, and not crack to anyone, she'd send the staff down to the supermarket and they would buy food parcels of the basic foods for the kids and all that stuff, come back, and then Trixie would get it sent round, right, to the customers wife and kids to make sure they got some dinner because she knew that the customer would be spending all the food money. 
So when you see these things called food banks, right, it's not new. Trixie Openshaw was running food banks back in the 70s. Uh, just a little little bit there. That's a true story, yeah. Right, and she, Trixie, str straight as a gun barrel. She's not interested in any drugs and all that, and she would not tolerate, honestly. Like Mickey, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the other story. Right, now Mickey... He likes to gamble, right, on the horses, right? Not a gambling addict. I mean, Tr Trixie wouldn't stand for that, right? So anyway, back in the 80s, right, and now I'm up in Birmingham, and who walks in? I'm in the hotel, nice hotel. Anyway, boom, who walks in the door? Mickey Openshaw. He's like, oh, mate, how you doing? Oh, Mickey, you right. What are you up to? I said, you out, you out working on the knocker? He went, nah, not really. He said, I'm going to Cheltenham tomorrow. He said, for the, uh, for the racing, right, Cheltenham Gold Cup and all that. Right, so I went, oh, all right, anyway, he pulls out a big parcel of jewellery. I went, oh that's, oh, that's nice. I said, have you bought that today? He went, no, nah. he said, I've taken it out of the safe at home. I've taken this jewellery out of my safe at home. He said, and I've brought it with me, so when I go home, I can show Trixie, right, and she'll think that I've bought it on the knocker, and she won't realise I've gone racing with the stock money. I went, oh, blimey, all right. So anyway, next day, Mickey goes racing at Cheltenham, right, and he's there, you know, chewing the pen, singing a home and all that game, right? So then comes back, boom. He then goes home, right, to see Trixie. Goes in and she's sitting there. And you know, I mean, her face, fucking hell. Talk about a poker face. She's looking at him, right? And I don't know if he realised. But anyway, he went, oh, hello, Trixie, darling, yeah. Right, he said, yeah, this is what I bought on the knocker this week. And she's looked at it all and she went, really? Is, you've been on the knocker, have you? He went, yeah, 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 of course. Well, she said, two days ago, she said, I was watching the Cheltenham Racing and I fucking saw you standing there by one of the bookmakers. Oh, my God, Mickey was only caught on camera by the BBC at Cheltenham, right, gambling, right? He's telling Trixie that he's been out on the knocker when he's been, right, when he's gone racing at Cheltenham. Right, and Trixie, I don't know what happens, right, but I think Trixie shouted so loud they heard her in Neptune, right, honestly. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, that's another funny story, isn't it, eh? But it's, uh, yeah, funny old world. Now, it's Sunday. I'm feeling a bit bloated, and I might have a kip. It's only up past one, and we're up to 22 minutes. So what should we call this? An in-between? I've done a 16-minute one, a 26-minute one, a 40-minute one, and a Sunday one, you know, uh, a bit of bony oak for Sunday. Um, and, you know, we can, we can carry on in the week and all that game. There's loads to come. I've got a big one, probably two, on Tony Connolly. Now, that one's going to come with a, a government health warning. That's not for the kids, you know what I mean? Well, none of this stuff really should be for the kids anyway, right? Um, you know, for children to listen to. Um, who else? Yeah, there's loads of them, honestly. I've got a list as long as your arm, you know what I mean? But don't worry, I'll get to you. Oh, and people keep emailing me. Is I don't mind you putting me up on there, Paul, but can you use a good photograph? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, apparently they all love it. <laughs> yeah, love it so much. People are on at me all the time. I'll send you a really good photograph. Can you not use an horrible one of me? I don't mind what you say, because everything you say is the truth. <laughs> Honestly, can you believe it? Right. So, um, we're at, yeah, 23 minutes. I don't know if I've got anything to say. If I go into another story now, shall I? Um... No, I can't. Anyway, 23 minutes. That's not a bad one for a Sunday. Okay, it's Art Hostage signing off. This is episode four, and we call this um, Mickey and Trixie Sunday Roast. Over and out from Art Hostage. <laughs>